many, many people. Uh, I will not uh, cite all, all the name, but let's mention that you have people from hydrodynamics, you have a theoretician, and I will uh, emphasize the role of the young people. So I have a PhD or postdoc people. So Alex Aitika and Adrien Kresh and Alexandre Lebel who did their PhD in our group. And Thibaut Congi, Giacomo uh, Roberti who, who played a, a crucial role in what I'm going to uh, present to you. Uh, so I will speak about two different perspectives on soliton gas. The first one will be how to build a soliton gas, so first what it is, of, of course, as an object, and how to build it in an experiment. And the second perspective of my talk will be how to use a soliton gas to understand a natural fundamental physical phenomenon. So let's go just to basic thing. I apologize for uh, experts in, in, uh, in the room and uh, people who have seen my talk and know this result by earth. I will try to speak to people who are uh, not expert. So I'm going to speak about solitons in integrable equation. And these objects are objects, uh, are wave packet that propagate and they interact non-linearly. But remarkably, when you look at long-term evolution, the only effect that you see from the interaction is a shift in the space. And there is also a phase shift, which does not play an important role in what I'm going to speak about. So it means that the, the white line that you see are the trajectory of solitons if they were alone. And you see that after the collision, you, you have some, uh, some shift. So the concept of soliton gas has been introduced uh, 50 years ago by uh, Zakharov. And he has introduced the concept of diluted soliton gas, soliton gas. So it means that solitons are well separated. They are weakly interacting. And you can see it as a random collection of, of solitons. So it means collection of solitons with random parameters. And more recently, uh, in, the, in the work of Gennadiel, the soliton gas uh, concept has been extended to the dense soliton gas. So in this case, you cannot distinguish by eyes the different solitons, OK? You have to think that the, it's a large wave packet in which you have many solitons, but you cannot distinguish them by eyes. And the key concept of the theory of soliton gas is the density of state, which correspond to a number of solitons with a given spectral parameter that I'm going to define in a second, at a given position and a, a given time. And you end up with uh, uh, a state equation, which is a continuity equation with a non-trivial uh, velocity. And this term here uh, corresponds to the space shift I was mentioning just before. So what is very interesting in all that, you have many uh, complex mathematical, mathematical feature and physical phenomena. Uh, it's when you have inhomogeneous soliton gas. But I'm going to speak to you about experiments, and we are at the beginning of experiments soliton gas. So I'm going to speak about the very simplest case in which the density of, of state will not depend on anything. Okay? So it means that here you would, you would have a trivial uh, behavior, okay? because we are at the beginning of, of experiments uh, in, in the field. Okay, so the, the, the I have been asked yesterday, uh, how would you define a soliton gas? And I, I, I would answer something else, which is how do you build a soliton gas? So if you go to the, the recent work of uh, Gennadiel and Alex Tobis, a very uh, a nice paper, an important paper in the, in the field, you would have uh, a rigorous building of soliton gas in the framework of finite gap. Okay, I will consider a simple model of, of uh, soliton gas in my in my talk, which is considering zero boundary condition and the standard inverse scattering transform. And in this framework, one soliton is represented by a pair or of eigenvalue. Uh, this is a discrete spectrum of the, of the sc uh, direct scattering transform. And the, the imaginary part of the eigenvalue is proportional to the amplitude of the soliton. And the real part is proportional to the velocity of the soliton in the, this representation. I will not say more about inverse scattering transform in, in my talk. I need to know that and the remarkable fact that the spectrum are constant of motion. So during the dynamics, the only thing that happens is that you have phase of the so-called norm-means constant that evolve. Be careful in all my talk because of the experiments, you see that the evolution variable is the length of propagation, it's Z. 
okay? And the physical time in my experiment in optical fiber and water time will correspond to conceptually to the space, okay? So be careful here, the evolution in Z correspond to the evolution as a function of a theoretical time, as a function of the variable of evolution. So I will define uh, solid on gas, I, it's not a definition, it's how I will build them, as a collection of many solitons to build the n soliton solution of focusing nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And I will put some random phase of the norming constant. So let's say that this is how I will build and how I think about uh, soliton gas. So I'm gonna show you uh, experiments, uh, this picture in, uh, in, in our lab uh, in Lille. Uh, in optics, in optical fibers, and we do experiments uh, in the Ecole Centrale uh, of Nantes in, in water time. So in both cases, the, the experiments, what, is, uh, what describes the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, it is a slow varying amplitude of the wave. So it means that you have a carrier wave. Of course, in both experiments, the time scale of the carrier wave is extremely different because it's typically femtosecond in optics and second in the, in the deep water time experiments. And the time scale of the soliton will be very different. It will be picosecond in our uh, experiments and it will be a few seconds in water time, so uh, uh, order of magnitude. But the typical lens of propagation that you need to see some nonlinear effects are roughly the same, let's say 100 of meters or a few hundred of, of, uh, of meters. So here is uh, a pioneer paper in the realization of, uh, of soliton gas in the group of uh, Nicolas Mordant. And here, what they do, they use uh, the soliton uh, fission that you have in shallow water ex experiments uh, that is described uh, at leading order by KDV and, and Stefano during his talk has spoken about the zabrowski kruskal mechanism. So they launch in the water tank, shallow water, large sine wave. You have the fission that creates your solitons and because you have reflection at the end of the water tank, at the end there is a kind of randomization and they always put energy, okay, always put some sign and they end up with random collection of solitons. But you understand that here you don't control the soliton gas in the sense that you don't control which soliton you put and which density of state in the framework of the inverse scattering transform. So the question is how to control the soliton content in an experiment. So the, the thing that I will do is to use the end soliton solution of nonlinear Schrodinger that are known since 50 years but surprisingly, it's only a few years ago that is have been demonstrating that it's possible to compute them numerically, okay? They were formally known, but you have a lot of problem in the accuracy uh, when you look just at, at the formula, okay? So by using arbitrary precision uh, technique and dressing method, kind of double transformation for, for the expert, uh, Gelash and Agafontet have, have shown a few years ago that it's possible to build this exact end soliton solution of nonlinear Schrodinger equation with hundred of solitons. So you see that here it's very different than the rarefied gas introduced historically. You see this is my huge wave packet built with 200 solitons, but you cannot distinguish them. The pack, the pack that you see here are not the solitons, they are the product, the effect of the interaction between all the solitons. So we can do that in experiment, and it's what we have done uh, uh, in this paper, first with uh, a few number of uh, solitons. So we, we build uh, this n soliton by choosing some eigenvalue uh, in the IST uh, spectrum. And you have here the evolution uh, in the water tank. So we shift, of course, the time by using the retarded frame, okay, with the group velocity of the car wave. We do the Hebert transform of the wave to extract the information that corresponds to the physics of the nonlinear Schrodinger uh, equation. And we record with gauges every six meter in the water tank, the spatiotemporal uh, dynamics. And here, what you have in different colors correspond to the uh, IST spectrum computed for different lengths of propagation. So at different 
conceptually at different time, okay, during the, the evolution. And you see that more or less you have isospectrality. Of course, it's not perfect because you are not in an experiment. I remind you that the spectrum of IST, if you are exactly integrable, if you are exactly described by nonlinear Schrodinger equation, it would be a constant. And you see here that you have some small change in the density of state, but more or less you, you, you keep the same. So now we can try to do something which is more uh, statistic, so a real gas, by putting uh, 100 uh, 28 uh, of these solitons. So this is the initial density of state that we put. All the points that you have here correspond uh, here at the beginning of the water tank of uh, the inverse scattering transform um, uh, spectrum. And this is what you get at the end of the water tank. And this means that now we can compute the density of state which correspond to a probability density function uh, in the IST plane per unit uh, time, so per unit space conceptually, okay? And we look at the evolution of this density of state in the complex plane as a function of the propagation, and you see that you don't preserve exactly isospectrality, uh, because of high order effect that breaks slightly integrability, okay? And here you have simulation of the full order equation that show that measurements are consistent with what you would expect. So this is the first, to the best of our knowledge, this is the first uh, control realization of a soliton gas, which means that we build it by knowing the uh, density of state and we propagate and we check that it remains more or less isospectral. So now I will speak about my second perspective, which is how to use this concept of soliton gas to describe a well-known fundamental uh, physics phenomenon. And I will look at the modulation instability that appear in the focusing uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So this instability, it's sometimes called a side bound instability, means that the plane wave solution, so the homogeneous solution at time equals zero, you would have one, which is uh, an amplitude which would be uh, uh, constant uh, if it was just one. If you add some perturbation, so harmonic um, sinusoidal perturbation, you will have an exponential growth of this perturbation if omega enter within what is called the gain of modulation instability. And the physics, the spatial temporal, this is numerical simulation, the spatial temporal evolution of uh, plane wave perturb with uh, uh, sine perturbation give the well-known Brazer solution such as the acme uh, 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 Brazer. So the spontaneous modulation instability, which is gonna be the, the phenomenon I, I'm gonna to look at, is quite the same thing, but now you don't put a sine perturbation, you put something that happens all the time in, in, uh, in, in nature or in the lab, if you just launch monochromatic wave in an optical fiber, you will have immediately this phenomenon. You always have some small noise in initially, and what you will have is exponential uh, growth of all the frequencies that are in this noise and that belong to the uh, modulation instability gain, okay? So you end up with this uh, complex spatial temporal uh, dynamics, and this problem has been investigated a lot but there is a very important paper in 2015 by Agafonsev and Zakharov that show that despite the fact that it's an integrable system, if you go at long-term evolution of this problem, you end up with a stationary state in the statistical sense. So after some oscillation of the statistical variable, you end up with this peculiar shape of the Fourier spectrum, okay? you end up with uh, exponential uh, probability density function of the modulus square of psi. This corresponds to a Gaussian statistics for the field. I'm speaking, of course, about the single point statistics, but it's not just a linear superposition of waves that would give you Gaussian statistics. If now I look at the uh, correlation is something that we have done a, a, a bit later after the, the paper of Agafon and Zakharov. If you look at the correlation between uh, two points in intensity, which is called the G2 in, for in, uh, in quantum optics, you have this remarkable uh, oscillatory structure. So 
keep in mind this feature, they characterize the long-term evolution of the spontaneous modulation instability in the statistical sense. But up to now, or up to uh, recent work, there was no theoretical description of that, okay? Surprisingly, because modulation instability, if you just do modulation instability focusing NLS in Google Scholar, you will find thousands of papers, okay? But th this is not understood. So what we can do is to look at this problem with the perspective of soliton gap. If I consider uh, zero boundary condition limit, it means that my plane wave will correspond to a very large box, okay? And the eigenvalue of a very large box are theoretically known. I'm speaking about the eigenvalues, uh, the highest eigenvalues. And they are described by this formula. So they all lie on the imaginary axis. So it means that a very large box the soliton content, it's full of solitons that have no velocity because no real part, and they are distributed here with a statistical distribution that you can get from this formula by, by deriving n with lambda, which is this uh, vile distribution. So this is a statistical distribution that you will get for the, uh, the eigenvalue of the solitons for a very large box. So let's build the soliton gas made with this eigenvalues and putting random phase for the numbing constant. Because of course, if I have just a box, I don't have at all no uh, random phase for the numbing constant. I have specific relationship between the phase of, of the numbing constant, okay? Now I want to look at the long-term evolution of this guy with some randomness and I put random phase between zero and two pi of the numbing constant and let's build the n soliton solution. And this is an example of the guy that we get with this arbitrary precision technique. And this is the exact n soliton solution of nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And let's run NLS solver with this guy. This is what you get here. So this is the spatial temporal evolution of my n soliton built in a very specifically, uh, in a very specific way. And here, to compare, I have drawn the spatial temporal evolution of the plane wave with some small noise, okay? So of course, at the beginning, you have almost no evolution. You have the exponential growth of the perturbation. And here, you have this uh, uh, striking feature of a spontaneous modulation instability spatial temporal dynamic. And by eyes, when you compare the both, you say, oh, okay, maybe it's quite the same. So we can look now at the statistical variables that I, I, I have spoken about uh, a few minutes ago. So this is a comparison between the Fourier spectrum of this guy at, uh, uh, of the, the n-soliton solution and of the spontaneous modulation instability at long-term evolution. You see that they perfectly match. The same for all the statistical variables that you could imagine. So for example, the probability density function of the modulus square of psi, which is exactly the exponential, and this G2 function with these oscillatory waves. Okay, you don't see any difference between the two. So what, what is the conclusion? The conclusion is that you can model precisely the spontaneous modulation instability by using a soliton gas which is specifically de de designed. So let's uh, speak about what we can observe about this problem of spontaneous modulation instability. So in photonics, in optical fibers, uh, first observation uh, come from the 80s. And initially, it was only the spectrum. Because the spectrum, it is, if you look at the, the rainbow, the rainbow is a spectrum of, of the light of the sun. Okay, So the, the spectrum is what is very easy to measure in optics. And it's much more difficult to measure the field, and in particular to measure the phase. So you have to wait for a very long time for, uh, up to work uh, in the group of uh, John Dudley in 2016 to observe some small part of the fluctuation of the intensity induced by spontaneous modulation instability in optical fibers. And in our group, we have developed two approaches. One is in a recirculating fiber loop in which you can measure the spatial temporal evolution. I will not go into detail, but at each round trip, we are able to capture uh, the dynamics. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not at all a, 
a dissipative system, okay? We try to compensate the, the loss with gain, and this is more or less described by the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So you see uh, experimental recording of the, the dynamics. And we have developed a technique to measure, if you want, we can discuss uh, during the question or, or after, during lunch, how we do that, but we have developed a technique to measure phase and intensity of the electric field with sub picosecond time scale in single shot. So it means that we are able to record the electric field at the output of optical fibers, and because we have the, 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 the measurement of the complex field, we can compute the IST spectrum. That is why I, I, we are interested in that. So this is an example. So we launch something which is more or less a constant in uh, the optical fibers, and this is a measurement of the intensity of the phase. Be careful, this box is not the physical box. It is due to the measurement technique. I have only access to uh, one or 200 picosecond, okay? In, in, in the observation. But the physics actually lasts much more, it's 30 nanoseconds typically in the experiments, okay? So there is, there is no dynamics due to this front because this front is just a front of observation, okay? The physics is still less. So we can compute the IST of this guy. I have zero boundary condition because of my observation, okay? So I have this discrete point and you can compare to the uh, uh, theoretical uh, value of the, the, of the IST of, uh, of a box. Okay, you are very happy, but this is your initial condition. And I will show you when we put quite a lot power in a single mode fiber and we propagate. And this is what we get at the end. So the, this is the amplitude square of the field and this is the full developed modulation uh, instability, and this is the measurement of the phase. And here in the green dots correspond to the spectrum of uh, the IST spectrum of this field. And you see that it has changed, okay? So it has changed. This means that it's not perfectly described by the integral by nonlinear Schrodinger equation, and we have high order effect. So if you look at the probability density function of the imaginary part of the, the, the IST spectrum that I've just shown you, it's not that bad, okay? We have launched something which corresponds to the Weyl distribution. This is in dashed line, and this is what we get in, in the experiments. So it means that you see here, vertically, I mean, the, the, the most important uh, perturbation is horizontally in for the real part, but the imaginary part statistically are not that per perturbed. So this is a 2D density of state in the experiment for the initial condition, and when you propagate, so you see that it broadens and you have some, this kind of asymmetry, okay? So here it goes more to the positive real part and here more to the negative real part. And this is numerical simulation of a generalized nonlinear Schrodinger equation that takes into account uh, high order dispersive effect and uh, the dissipation and the most important uh, point is the Raman scattering here. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, I've shown you observation in experiments of a controlled soliton gas. I've shown you that theoretically modulation instability can be described by a soliton gas. I've shown you that we have measured that uh, in optical fiber uh, experiment and that we can uh, measure the, the density of state. And of course, now there are many questions. Uh, one of the questions is that I've shown you the modulation instability example, but can we describe any random waves uh, in integrable system with soliton gas? So probably uh, not with just soliton gas because for experts you know that if you have weakly nonlinear uh, random waves, you will have continuous spectrum, okay? So it's one of the question is, for example, in, in the, the framework of uh, Gennady and Alex of this infinite gap, can we describe any integrable turbulence? One of the things that I've shown you the equivalence numerically between soliton gas and modulation instability, but of course we would like to understand it more in, in, uh, in uh, theory. Uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, all the group of uh, Gennady and in, in particular uh, Thibault and, uh, and Alex, uh, we have some results in which by using the soliton gas building, uh, we are able to compute 
the kurtosis okay, of the distribution. So it's the first step, but of course, what we would like to have is a statistical description uh, from the theoretical point of view. One of the important questions for me is to add in the theory of solid and gas perturbative effect that adiabatically break into gravity. And one of the most important challenge for the future for the experiments is to go to inhomogeneous gas, okay, to be able to, to test this nice complex continuity equation. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Questions? I don't know who was the first. Then we will have Mr. Brock. Great talk, thank you. I really enjoyed that. I'm wondering about the influence of the initial condition on your conclusions. Uh, you use a box initial condition, is that correct? Uh, in for the modulation the stability part, piece. You mean, you mean it's, a bo it's always a box, right? This? Yeah. So the, the box that we launched in the experiments uh, lasts 30 nanoseconds, and the observation is on 200 picoseconds. So right. this is in normalized time, but it corresponds to 200 picoseconds because of the technique of observation, but the physics is very large. So what it means that here, we have no effect in the experiments of the edge. On the edge, of course, there is a physics, which is the focusing dam break, okay? So on the edge, there are some physics, but it's very far away from what we observe. Okay, so in general, depending on the initial condition, you can use the Feynman propagator to determine the spacing of initial solitons that are seeded, and that could influence uh, your outcome. And I mention this because, of course, in, in fiber optics, in a water tank, it's very, very natural to begin with something fairly uniform and box-like. But in, in Bose condensates, which is another topic in this meeting, you, you typically have you know, a varying profile. And I think it'd be interesting to look at the difference in outcomes and how that connects to your soliton gas hypothesis, because this soliton gas uh, perspective could be used on these soliton train experiments for uh, you know, Bose condensates. But one would have to show for non-uniform initial profile that you get similar results. Definitely. Uh, thank you, Pierre. I'm sorry, this is a bit of a technical question. Uh, unless I'm mistaken, in your water tank experiment, uh, initially where the model is the focusing NLS with zero boundary conditions, when you showed the discrete eigenvalues, yes, right there, uh, you have quite a few eigenvalues that actually lie on the real axis. Now, those are different creatures from the point of view of inverse scattering. Those are not eigenvalues. They are embedded eigenvalues for spectral singularities. And I'm not sure that the technique that you, <coughs> that you mentioned uh, to renormalize the norming constants using the dressing method would work for those. So those are, I think, going to affect the, the comparison with the... Ah, so, because Gilash has worked a lot on that, we have discussed a lot, between the relationship between, the, you, you mean between the norming constant of the, uh, the dressing method and the norming constant of the IST. So the thing which is clear is that if you have, uh, that, uh, that Gelash has shown me, is that if you have a random phase uh, for the norming constant in IST, in the standard IST, you have random phase for the norming constant of the Dabu transformation. That's the only thing I'm sure about, okay? So the, 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 the relationship is slightly non-trivial because everybody depends on everybody, okay? But when you have randomness on the phase, then you have randomness in both. So I'm quite confident in this. And here, we measure the, the IST spectrum, but we don't measure the norming constant, okay? This would be another story for the pressure, for the accuracy. So we launch random phase for norming constant, but we don't tell you that we measure the, the norming constant after that, okay? okay. I, I just wonder about the, the, the embedded eigenvalues and the statements that you made. Yeah. So I, I want to, to take too much of time. Can you show your G G2 uh, function? Uh, so this kind of bunching, yeah. anti-bunching. So it's reminiscent <laughs> of something uh, Michael Berry introduced in, in, in the linear context for quantum chaos, where he, he had um, uh, random uh, plane waves. And he got something that looked like, a, uh, if I remember, a Bessel function for this uh, autocorrelation okay. in the linear context. I, is this a, a I Bessel? Don't, I don't know. I would be happy to look at that. I, I, I wouldn't think it's the same because here it's really, it appears as the nonlinear evolution of the, of the plane wave, okay? 
But I, I, it was really the same idea. So you take plane wave with random phases and add them up. And uh, yeah, but then if you just uh, we, we, I have to look in detail of uh, the I paper you are talking about because so. if you just have random waves, the G two will be above one. If you just if you just if you just do the linear superposition of uh, random waves, it's an exact result. Okay, it if you have just linear superposition of random waves, what you get is uh, something like one plus uh, G one square. So it's always ab about one. Okay, so the fact that you go below and above one uh, cannot be the linear superposition of wave as far as I know. So I would be happy to, to discuss with that. Uh, thing. Okay, we can take the last question and then we need to stop. It's actually about that same topic, the G2. So you showed us the asymptotic statistical steady state that you're reaching, but did you actually try to find the dynamics of the G2 towards that steady state? That is, presumably there is some convergent attracting dynamics of yeah, that G2. Yeah. Okay. We, di we have a lot of simulation about that, but not th no theoretical description. It's a very good question. You see this, this oscillation here of uh, uh, the kurtosis, so basically, uh, the nonlinear part of the Hamiltonian is, is proportional to the G2 at 2 equals 0, okay? So, so this fluctuation, this oscillation here corresponds to the oscillation of the point at 2 equals 0, okay? And, and, and the understanding, the precise understanding of that is still not clear. We are working on that. Th there is a kind of slow desynchronization of the phase of the numbing constant, but it's not clear. We work with Agathon Tess and Gelash, but we don't have a clear idea. Okay, thank you, Pierre, and let's thank all the speakers.